22-year-old musical genius Jacob Collier has reinvigorated serious interests in the world of music geeks like myself with his recent mention of negative harmony during his interview with June Lee. There's not a lot of info out there, so I decided to put this video together to help people and myself better understand the concept. So first, I've got to give some props out to June Lee, a music student at Indiana that has taken on the task of transcribing and notating Jacob Collier's music. Sure, both Jacob and June have perfect pitch, but the ability to understand what you are hearing, accurately write it down, and then properly and legibly notate music of this complexity is no small task. If there's a Pulitzer for music notation, June Lee should win one. I don't know June, but I admire his work and ask folks to visit his Patreon page and give him some, some financial love for his amazing work. So music itself is a complex topic. It's a language, science, history, math, it's art, etc. Now, I'm a huge champion of musical literacy. The more you understand, the more you can interpret what you hear, and the easier it becomes to create the ideas in your compositional mind. During the interview, Lee asked Collier about the negative harmony, a concept introduced by Ernst Levy in his book, A Theory of Harmony. Now, I've not read the book yet, but once I do, I'll update this video if any changes need to be made. So to understand the concept, let's first talk about a couple of terms. In the world of math, we all know what negative means, the opposite of a positive value, a value before zero, positive one versus negative one. Now, whether something is numerically positive or negative depends on its relation to the value of zero. Another way of saying this is that zero is the axis between positive and negative. A positive number can be considered a reflection of its negative counterpart. Now, harmony is the simultaneous combination of tones, especially when blended into chords pleasing to the ear. It's the opposite of dissonance. From the acoustical physics perspective, harmony refers to harmonics. When discussing negative harmony, Ernst Levy mentions the concept of musical polarity and reflections as they relate to natural harmonics. Levy uses an analogy by comparing positive and negative harmonics to the branches and roots of a tree. Positive harmonics are above ground, the trunk, the branches, etc., while negative is below ground, the roots. So in this example, the axis would be the ground. Above ground is positive and below ground is negative. Now let's tie this together with music theory. To keep it simple, we're going to stay in the key of C. In music, a key is defined by its root and the quality of its third scale degree. A C major chord has a root of C and then an E, four steps above the root. Three steps above the G is the fifth of the chord. The C chord is also called the tonic. It is home base. All chords are beholden to the tonic, some more so than others. The V chord, the G, is called the dominant chord. To our Western musical ears, the V chord has a strong tendency to want to resolve to its tonic. Now this is the circle of fifths. There are lots of versions of this musical chart out there. This one shows the position of the 1, the 4, and the 5 chord in the key signatures. This one is a little more basic. Outside the circle are the major keys. Inside the circle are the relative minor keys to each major key. Now this is one of my favorite versions. Check out this interactive tool at the URL at the bottom of the screen. It lets you select your key as well as mode, and then the chart changes based on your selections. So what does this have to do with the harmonic axis? Let's start with the keyboard and stick with the key of C for now. Here are the notes of the C major scale. Roman numerals are used to show the scale position and quality of chords built on those root notes. Capital letters mean major, lowercase indicate minor. So a triad built on C is the one chord and is major. A triad built on D, while still remaining in the key of C, is the two chord and is minor. When you play a scale starting on each note instead of a triad, you hear modes, a topic mentioned several times during Collier's interview. The sound you hear starting your scale on C is the scale or sonority that most people are used to, the Ionian mode. Working up the keyboard, we then have Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian, Aeolian, and Locrian. So C is our root, also known as the tonic. G is the fifth, also known as the dominant. Why is it called dominant? My answer is based on a good description of chord resolution I found in the book, Nonlinearities and Synchronization in Musical Acoustics and Musical Psychology, published by Dr. Ralph Bader in 2013. To paraphrase Dr. Bader, Hugo Riemann founded the functional music harmony that is still studied around the world today, including the use of Roman numerals. 
His view was that all music is cadence, starting from a chord as a tonic center or a home. Music and melodies leaving this home produce tension, while coming back to the home or tonic relieves this tension. Chords away from the tonic each have their own amount of dominance and naturally want to return to the tonic, some more so than others. There is a main dominant chord, the five chord, actually called the dominant. The four chord is considered slightly less dominant and is therefore known as the subdominant. The five chord has the strongest sonic desire to return home or to resolve, especially if voiced as a dominant seventh chord that includes the third and seventh, creating the tritone that naturally leads to the root and third of the home key. The concepts of dominant and subdominant, the five and four chords, tie neatly to the circle of fifths. In this circle, C is the tonic, the dominant G is to the right of the tonic, and the subdominant F is to the left. The circle builds on fifths going clockwise, the major sounding side of the circle according to Collier, and it builds on fourths going counterclockwise, the minor sounding side of the circle according to Collier. Again, this isn't a scientific concept, it's just one of the many ways Jacob Collier hears music. Okay, back to our keyboard. So where is the harmonic axis that leads us to this interesting concept of negative harmony? According to Ernst Levy, the axis of harmony is the harmonic midpoint between the tonic and the dominant. So to find that midpoint, we simply move inward from the tonic and dominant on the keyboard. We get to the point where the voices will cross over or collide. In this example, it's the space between E flat and E. Now this is the part of the concept that some people have a hard time grasping. Levy says that the axis is between these notes. I interpret this to mean that we cannot have a note itself as the axis. We have to have a starting point of zero, or a ground level like in the tree analogy, an actual midpoint or axis to create a reflection point that generate positive and negative note choices. So according to Levy, notes above this axis are positive, below it is negative. This is where positive and negative harmony polarity come from, according to Levy's theory. Positive notes have a reflection on the other side of the axis. So here's another way of visualizing this axis. Here are all the notes from the tonic to the dominant. Our tonic is at the bottom, the dominant is at the top. As we've learned, the dominant has the strongest tendency to want to resolve back to its home base, the tonic. Now let's look at this from a science or math perspective. Middle C resonates at 261.63 hertz. Its dominant resonates at 391 hertz. The midpoint of the axis we are talking about is at 327.32 hertz. But when you try to find that on the keyboard, you can't. It falls between E and E flat. So above this axis is our positive side. Below this axis is our negative side. Okay, so I think we've got the idea down now. The axis is the reflection point between positive and negative harmony. Now, how do we actually apply this to chords? Using the axis as the zero in our number line, we now count outward in both directions from the axis, numbering each note in the process. Doing so creates a set of positive notes and their negative counterparts. We will use these numbers in a bit to replace standard harmony with negative harmony. But first, I want to make sure we all understand that the axis location depends on the key you are in. Every example so far I've been talking about has been in the key of C, so I want to make sure an important concept is understood. The axis depends entirely on what key you're in. Please do not leave this video thinking that the beginning of negative harmony is between E and E flat. So for example, here's what it looks like in the key of G. The tonic is now G, the dominant is now D. The axis is now between B and B flat, because this is the harmonic location in the middle of the dominant and dominant. Counting from the new axis in G gives different numbers for each note than those in the key of C. Now let's take a look at how the circle of fifths can be used to find note reflections. Here's our friend, the circle of fifths. I'm going to tweak it just a bit. I've rotated the circle a little bit counterclockwise so that the line between C and G is now perfectly vertical at the noon position on this dial. I've also renamed it the axis circle because this line happens to be exactly where the negative harmony axis is in the key of C. On the right is the positive, the left is the negative, and our light and dark sides. Now let's put this tool to use and find some actual positive-negative note pairings. 
The axis of the midpoint between C and G, meaning that C and G are opposites. So by moving across the spectrum here horizontally, we find that the positive and negative notes are exactly opposite each other. D maps to F, A maps to B flat, E maps to E flat, B to A flat, and F sharp to D. And here's our axis. And here's our light and dark. Another way to view this positive negative note pairings is to list all 12 notes while making the middle of that list the axis like this. Here's the axis in the key of C. There's our tonic and dominant. And now we start pairing notes based on where they are in relation to the axis. E goes to E flat, F goes to D, F sharp to D flat, G to C, A flat to B, A to B. Hopefully one of these two chart formats makes sense to you. So now let's get to the harmony part of this theory. In the key of C, the C triad is the one chord. It's the first position in C and the C major scale. If we add the seventh note to the triad, we get C major seven chords. They consist of C, E, G, and B, the root, third, fifth, and seventh of the chord. Now I'll slide our C major seven chord over to the right to put it on the positive side of our axis. The negative side is on the left. Now I'll color the notes to match the polarity wheel in the corner to help visualize the process, and we can now start pairing notes. B goes to A flat, G goes to C, E pairs with E flat, and C pairs with G. When you combine these new notes into a four part chord, you get an A flat major seven chord. Here are the components of that chord, the root, third, fifth, and seventh. And this is our first chord substitution of the video. In C major, the negative chord of C major seven is the A flat major seven chord. A flat is the flatted sixth in C. So the flatted 6 major 7 chord is the negative of a 1 major 7 chord. So this is the basis of negative harmony, replacing the notes of chords with their negative reflections to create a different chord. Here are the 7 chords based on the C major scale. When you substitute all the notes in the seventh chords for the negative counterparts, you get this. Here's something that reinforces the idea that we are working with negative harmony, sort of like a parallel universe. The chords that are major on the positive side, the one, four, and five, are now minor on the negative side. This makes sense since we are talking about harmonic opposites. The five chord on the negative side replaces the two chord. Normally the two chord is minor, but replacing it with a G chord, which is the five and C, you'd expect the G chord to be major, but G is minor on the negative side. Remember, we're still in the key of C. We have not modulated to A flat or something else. We are in the key of negative C major. C is still a one, G is still a five, but their qualities change because we are in this alternate harmonic universe. And for me, the bottom row of this table is the most useful when it comes to musical application of the concepts. So this top table is C major in yellow and its negative counterpart in blue directly below. The bottom table can be applied to all major keys. Just replace the Roman numeral chord in the yellow with a chord directly below it in the blue row. Now an important thing to keep in mind is that the substitutions shown here only work for the diatonic chords in a key. If you alter a chord, perhaps you make your two chord dominant instead of minor in order to emphasize moving to your five, you will need to adjust the voicing to account for the F sharp you've added to your normally minor two D chord. In this case, you'd replace the D minor two with a D seven, which reflects to G half diminished. In other words, to substitute changes in songs more complex than just diatonic chords, you will have more work to do. So now we come to the big finale. What does all this actually sound like? Here is the polarity circle for G major, the key of our musical examples. Let's give a listen to the first phrase of the classical standard, Autumn Leaves by Johnny Mercer. Now these are just basic voicings of the standard changes. I'm showing both regular and Roman numeral notation here.
now let's substitute the standard positive polarity changes for their negative counterparts. Here are the standard changes. And here's the substitution table. And here are the substitutions for negative chords. How did I get there? Like this. Go to the 2, find the chord below, and replace that 2 with a 5, and keep repeating that process for all the changes. Now let's give it a listen. Quite different, right? Most of it sounds good to my ears, but there's one substitution that hits me as a little odd. So I'm going to sub out only some of the chords to get a different harmonization. So my substitutions are at the bottom. The three versions are lined up so you can compare original and standard chords to their negatives and my choice of negative blended with standard changes. So here's what my blended version sounds like. So I think that sounds better. So let's take a look at what's happening in my version of the chord progression. The blue highlights are the negative chords that I substituted in place of the standard changes. So here we're going from D minor to D7. That's just a minor to major change, nothing radical. From D7 to G, we've got a typical 5 to 1 motion, very pleasing to the ear. Now this change is the most direct or jarring to me. Movement of a minor third like this is a very abrupt movement. Now John Coltrane used major thirds as the basis of what we now call Coltrane changes. Minor third movement implies a more diminished feel, and I've got to research why this works. So we have E flat to F, which is 1 to 5. F7 to B7, that's just a tritone substitution. And then B to E is just a 5 to 1. Then here's that minor third movement again. It's kind of jarring. Maybe that's the point of negative harmony. It's not always incredibly perfect sounding, but I think it's pretty cool nonetheless. That being said, folks, you've reached the end of the video, so go forth and harmonize, and be sure to use your new powers only for good. Also, please consider making a donation to June Lee's Patreon page. His transcriptions of Jacob's music are very, very impressive. And as a final shameless plug, if you have a need for any original underscore music for your video, TV, or film use, please check out my own